your grandmother's ETFs, that's not Bitcoin. Bitcoin is peer to peer. Bitcoin is communities. And we need to go back to its rebel roots. All I see are financial institutions that are coming in and they're trying to mirror the current financial system that we have in the world. Bitcoin was anti that. If we allow these people to come in and KYC everyone and just create a, a new banking system on top of what Bitcoin is, then we're losing. Everyone that wants to have privacy has less and less chance to. I hate being photographed without my permission. If I see someone holding a camera, I'm the guy that's looking down. You have these new laws that are coming in and saying, well, you have to give this information. You have to dox everything about yourself. I do think that in five or 10 years, we're going to wake up and go, holy we have a privacy nightmare. The only true minority is the individual. A lot of homeless people don't have the ability to walk into a bank and start saving money, but Bitcoin can give them that ability. There's Bitcoin Brock coming up, right? There's, uh, are you there? I am. I have a keynote um, on the main stage, so I'm preparing for that. Yeah. Should be fun, um, but yeah, it's gonna be. It's yeah, the pre preparation is the most stressful part. Once it like once you're there, it's it's fun, it's great. So I'm looking forward. Yeah. Um, I mean, we can get uh, directly into that. Like, uh, do you already have like a direction where you want to go with the the keynote, or like an probably like privacy and 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 Vexel, But uh, is is there a specific direction you want to go with? Yeah. Um, it's, it, really, there is, uh, which is like Bitcoin. The further we get away from the adoption and like from the invention of Bitcoin, um, the more we lose its rebel roots. And so peer to peer is actually at the very heart of what Bitcoin is. Um, and the further you know we get, we're losing that. And it's communities that are essential to the success of Bitcoin. I mean, like you can look at your podcast and you can see that you have a community that you're building and, you know, you are an educator, you're an interviewer, you're a journalist, you're, you're a person who is kind of helping to educate masses and create accessible information. And, you know, the internet has been great, but it's also so important to look into your local community and start creating these kind of like meetups because we want to encourage adoption. And that's from your merchants, that's from the stores. Well, if you don't have sort of a local community that are helping or at least talking about Bitcoin and, and you know, you know, your orange pill crew that are going around and, you know, maybe you're getting your tires rotated or your tires changed and you want to pay your mechanic in Bitcoin. Well, if you don't have a local infrastructure, a local meetup or community, then some of that information that you want to kind of give to these people can get lost really easily. So my kind of approach and my my talk to it is that not your grandmother's ETFs, that's not Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is peer to peer, Bitcoin is communities, and we need to go back to its rebel roots and understand that that's what makes, that's why we're all here. You know, Bitcoin <laughs> was a answer to that. So yeah. is it dangerous uh, that we have those kind of central, I mean, there's like, when you look at holdings, most mm. people hold it on Coinbase, then the Bitcoin ETFs make like an uh, additional park on that because most have it on Coinbase. Bitcoin ETFs in general is like a centralization of holdings. Uh, then we have big exchanges where most people buy. They are usually KYC. They usually have like data links and stuff like that. Uh, is is like obviously Bitcoin is really decentralized. Yeah. But all the stuff on top of Bitcoin as the Bitcoin ETFs, the exchanges, KYC, all the stuff, is that, can this, this be a threat to Bitcoin or is it just a threat to the individual? Mm. Uh, you know, I look at it as a threat to the individual because how I use Bitcoin is, you know, is right now, um, it's very easy to get distracted by all of these centralized figures and agencies and, and, and companies that are creating these solutions. Um, but what I kind of see and how I use Bitcoin is very, very different than how some other people, you know, use Bitcoin is, you know, you have like, even this week, I, you know, on Twitter, you see like this guy saying, oh, like Bitcoin is still a speculative asset. You know, it's like you're speculating on it because you're investing and it's like, but am I investing 
if I actually use Bitcoin on a daily basis or if I get paid in Bitcoin. Um, so for me, it's not an investment. It's a means of, you know, transactions and it's a means to, you know, as someone who travels a lot, um, you know, I, I move from, you know, this year I've been in Poland and Madeira. I live in Czech Republic. I go to England, you know, and these countries still have different currencies. You know, Poland is, you know, not as on a currency. Czech Republic's on a different one. Then you have the euro. Um, so for me, Bitcoin is a means of transaction and I enjoy spending my Bitcoin. So when I look at these centralized kind of companies like Coinbase that, you know, Coinbase has been around for a long time. Um, you know, I, I can't say they didn't provide a service. They didn't do, you know, something good for Bitcoin because that what they did is they enabled Bitcoin for a lot of people. Um, but, you know, now we look at it and we say, well, these KYC practices and this kind of stuff have come into play and it's become kind of dangerous for the individual because my personal information is being passed around through all of these different agencies and, 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 and companies. And that's a risk to me because my personal data is important. And the more you start to learn about Bitcoin, the more you start to learn about the way the direction and the, the world is heading, the more you start to go, well, maybe I should be more careful with my data and my privacy. Yeah, I mean, look, look, sorry. Uh, yeah, I just want to uh, get into that because we talked about it before and I myself can uh, conclude to that because I got way more careful with privacy. I have a little bit of a problem because I'm really outspoken about Bitcoin and my face and my clear name is there and stuff like that. And kind of my goal is to be as well known as possible. I mean, my real goal is like to educate people on, on, on Bitcoin, have great conversations with Bitcoiners, but this has an implication because I try to get better every day. This makes me more well known also. This makes also me as a bigger target for people that uh, want to yeah, get to my Bitcoin, basically. Um, but in general, I feel like everyone that wants to have privacy has less and less chance to. And there, there, there are so many avenues we can go through. There's like this, this KVC and the state wants to know everything about you. Then there's also like, we have now phones everywhere. Like there's always cameras. Uh, you are probably in like 20 different camera roles from people where they just click pictures of something and you were just passing by. Uh, and then they're like in, in the Apple iCloud, then there's AI that can collect all those things and connect it. Like there's so many different things in that. Are we like on the one side, uh, in a war against privacy kind of, or is that like just also a trend that's continue? Like what, what do you see with that? Is, is privacy yeah. really fine? You mentioned something that like has been in my head for years, which is like, can you imagine all of the crazy photos that are taking of you, taken of you? Like you're just walking through the city and there's a bunch of tourists taking photos. Like I live in one of the most touristy cities in Europe and, like I, you know, every time I go to the city center, I'm on how, how many people's, but as I've kind of, you know, started to deal with living in this world where there's a camera in someone's hand constantly, you know, I, I hate being photographed without my permission. Um, you know, I'm the guy that if you, if I see someone holding the camera, I'm the guy that's looking down, you know, I usually wear a hat and I do look down and it's not because I don't because I don't want some crazy, awkward photo of me lining up in the iCloud where they've mapped all of my facial expressions and emotions. And now you see how AI can take just a few pictures of someone or, you know, they can take this podcast with you and me and they can recreate a deep fake and do all these kinds of things. So, yeah, I do think there is a, a war, you know, for privacy currently going on. Um but it's a, you know, everything is done in the name of convenience or security. And that's what, what, what bothers me is I don't feel that I live in a more secure world because I've given up my private, my right to privacy in a lot of ways, you know, and I go back to, you know, growing up in the South of America. Um, you know, I'm from Mississippi originally and Mississippi was a place where privacy was important. Um, but you know, you, you would go to church on Sunday and that's where you would get all the gossip, right? Is people, so humans are naturally inclined to want to invade other people's privacy, right? 
it's like um i you know i have a kind of a, a thing as you might be able to see it over here on my windowsill but i have this briefcase and um i walk around with this briefcase and whenever i'm at a conference or some sort of event and the first day nobody says anything to me but then the second day people start going hey man what's in the box and that you know it naturally triggers something is the unknown or or the curiosity in people they want to know things about other people and so I look at like how the internet has enabled us to kind of share everything we have about ourselves and they encourage you to share. You know, you remember the early days of Facebook where people were like, look, I'm having this for lunch or I'm doing this right now. And then, you know, you move into Instagram stories where you tell the story of your life. And I believe that that's absolutely fine. I believe that privacy is the right to selectively reveal yourself. So if you want to share that kind of information, absolutely more than happy to you know you look at TikTok and all of these things well yeah this is creating a atmosphere where they encourage you to share as much as possible and that's something that you know is alarming because you're being desensitized to a lot of things of you know is my mom is a really good example is I would always ask her, she'd go, Oh, I don't care. I have nothing to hide. You know, I have nothing to hide. And I'm like, yeah, well, okay. Let me see your phone, you know, like give me your phone, your unlocked phone. And how many people would be willing to pass you their unlocked phone? And that's something that concerns me is because with my personal data and with the data that is used for KYC, um, that is a lot of information about a person that can be used in lots of nefarious ways. And so, you know, I don't want to give that information up to someone just because it makes it more convenient for me to do something. If I'm going to give that information to someone, I want to make sure that it's being protected in the correct, right way. And I shouldn't need permission to participate in something like Bitcoin or these things is without that freedom to transact. I don't believe you have any other right. So we live in a world where you have to get permission to do everything, it seems. And that's a lack of freedom. And I think that that's where the war on privacy becomes kind of clear to me is that, you know, when you have um, documents being published, it says you shouldn't use services that don't do KYC. Um, but how can I trust any service? Like what, what, where do I put my trust? And that's, mm. that's the thing that's so hard um, to determine is who to really trust. I also feel like that KYC is not only being like completely normalized, but also like really pushed for. Like, uh, I feel like in, especially in the European Union, we have a really a push for like, oh, KYC, know your customers, know, like collect data regardless. I mean, there's also like the data privacy laws and stuff like that, but, uh, we've seen <laughs> as this has been implemented and when it comes to, to financial stuff and banking, all of this, oh, we have to know everything because then they can do illegal stuff with that. But no, they, that's, it's, it's also, privacy like you, you should not uh, know everything about a, a person um do you do you fear that like kyc not non-kyc on peer-to-peer is something just illegal in like five ten twenty years or, or not illegal but something that is being outlawed yeah well i mean yeah it's very interesting because you know I, I also, like I said previously, I grew up in the South and in America, you know, if you get pulled over for, there's very little privacy in America. If you get stopped by the police and you get charged with something and you are innocent, but you were charged for it, um, your name, your photograph, your date of birth, your address appears in the public, in the newspaper, right? So even if you have not been convicted, if you've just been arrested for something, even if you're wrongly can, can, you know, accused of something, um, and that information is there pretty much forever um, because of the way the internet works. But, you know, you look at Europe and you have like GDPR and then, you know, we go like, okay, well, what does that mean? And you have such strict privacy laws when it comes like if I even take a photo of 
a car on the street, if I don't blur the license plate, then I, there is some sort of burden on me, you know, that you have to be careful with these kinds of things. So you have these things that are protecting your privacy, but then you have these new laws that are coming in and saying, well, you have to give this information. You have to dox everything about yourself. So your question is very interesting because I do think that in five or 10 years, we're going to wake up and go, holy shit, we have a privacy nightmare because everyone's personal data has been leaked and is out there. You know, look at what happened in El Salvador with Chivio Wallet is you onboard the population of the country and then all of the country's information winds up on the dark web. And that to me is, yeah, I do think that eventually we will have a serious wake up call and go, wow, this was a mistake. And um, we should not have these sort of laws. And, you know, we are, we live in a different world than a lot of people do. We live in a, in a West, the Western world that has laws and has these things in place and has banks and, and these institutions. But a lot of the world, you have so many people in the world who do not have identification, who don't have bank accounts, who, who don't have the ability to participate in a normal system. And you have refugees, um, you know, asylum seekers who have left their country due to war or anything, and they've left everything behind. And they're coming somewhere new and they're going, well, you don't have the requirements, so you sorry, you can't participate in the system. And, you know, we've seen that. We see that happening on a, on a daily basis. And then, um, you know, so I, I think that your question is, is, is a very interesting one because I, I really do think that maybe we're going to wind up seeing KYC as a stretch too far, is giving your information to companies who should never have had it. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned that uh, you have no privacy in America. Is, is that the reason why you are now in, in, in Europe and not no longer in, in, in America? No, um, I was just from a very young age fascinated with with history in Europe and, and things. And, um, you know, growing up in Mississippi, it's hard to get out of Mississippi. Um, You know, most people I know are married at 19 and have kids and then they're divorced by 24 and then they work at the, you know, the manufacturing jobs. And it's really hard to get out of there. And, you know, Mississippi is a tough place. It's still the most illiterate, most obese, you know, the health care, the education system is still really poor. Um, but I was very, very fortunate from a young age um, to have that curiosity to seek other things. And uh, I went to like boarding school um, and I met people from all over the world. And that was the first time that I was outside of my bubble. I still have my Southern accent, you know, it's still there. But from a very young age, I started meeting people and I realized that the world is a lot bigger than Mississippi. And um, I went to school in Texas, university in Texas. And um I did like a study abroad program and it went over to England and I had some just amazing professors that just told me, Hey, it's possible. If you want to live over here and explore, it's possible. Like don't limit yourself. So, um, when I graduated from university, you know, I had a teaching degree in history and I said, you know what, instead of teaching high school for a year or like instead of starting and teaching people who hate, hate you just because you're a teacher, um, like kids, I I'm going to go do a year in, in Czech Republic because I came here for like a four day weekend and I had an awesome time, met, met friends and kept in touch. So I was like, yeah, I'll do one year. I'll do one year in Czech Republic. So I came over here and started teaching English. And then I look up and now I've been here 13 years. My life is here. My dog, I have, you know, I've settled here. I love it. My Czech friends, my, my life here is better than it's, I could imagine it being anywhere else. And so when I look at the United States, you know, I, I said this before, but like the United States used to be, and it still is for a lot of people, this beacon of freedom and, and hope and that anything is possible. Um, but when you really kind of study and what's knowing what's going on in the world, you look at it and you go, <laughs> it's also a failed state. It's, you know, it's in decline and you, it's really hard, I'd say to, to be, um, to make it there, you know, homelessness in America is, is probably worse there than anywhere else that I've seen. 
Um, the country is is very different. I look at my hometown in Mississippi where, you know, we didn't have homelessness growing up. We didn't have this. And now every stop sign and traffic light has a homeless person at it. Under every bridge, there's there's people sleeping. And for me, that's just something is fundamentally wrong. And you look at the situation with people's finances and inflation and how do you escape that? And I, that's where why I think Bitcoin is so interesting is because it enables anyone to start to save. You know, a lot of homeless people don't have the ability to walk into a bank and start saving money. But Bitcoin can give them that ability today. And I, I think that when you start requiring you know, it, it going back and touching on it is, is that's where I, I still think the risk is. So why do I live over here? I don't know. I just like it. I, I like living here, but also there's nothing like a post communist country that understands mm -hmm. what it means to have freedom. And the further you get away from obtaining your freedom, the more likely you are to start giving it away again and becoming less free. So I, I like the Czech Republic because there is a sense of that rebelness here that, you know, we have to protect that freedom. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm often there because I'm really close to the border as we discussed before. Uh, and I always love the country. I mean, uh, it's the, the food is way cheaper there and, and, and living is way cheaper than in Austria and it's just, just a half a half an hour ride. So I, I, I love it also because of there. <laughs> sometimes like make, make it like a two day trip there and it's almost like saving money if you live there, uh, yeah. even with the, the, the transportation costs and stuff like that. Um, which is also interesting. We talked about that before a little bit before we recorded uh, because you are from America and over 50% of my viewership is in America. But your company, Vexel, like the company you're working for, Vexel, is not in America. Yeah. Let's get into that. Why? Like, why? And it, it also, uh, as an additional information, uh, I had Beach Bitcoin on from Swiss. Uh, and they are also saying, yeah, we're in all, uh, we're basically everywhere, but we're not marketing everywhere. And we're definitely not in America. Like, she, she also had, had this clear, like, we're not in America. Yeah. I mean, look, I, w I would love to be. Right. I would love to, 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 to say that we are available everywhere in the world. Um, but the way that things are right now is we really want to build a tool and we want to make something that, yeah, anyone and everyone can use. Uh, but we don't want to lose that ability to create something that can truly empower individuals um, by going in America. And, and, you know, it's just something that right now it doesn't seem like the freest place to do business or to do anything. And, you know, when I say business, like Vexel is, is a nonprofit. We do not monetize. We will never monetize. This is a free and open source tool. So when I look at it is, yeah, our, our, we're on GitHub. Go, anyone can go and, and, and look at it and take it and fork it, do whatever they want with it. But yeah, you know, I kind of joke that there's there's a few countries where we're not truly available, and that's like North Korea, China, uh, United States, and like Iran. And I go like, yeah, there's some sort of weird new axis of Bitcoin evil. Um, and you know, it's like I don't think that you know, truly deep down, it's like I don't know if there if we would have some sort of problem if we went and we lost in America. I don't I don't know. Um, but the fact is, is that I because we don't know and because of it is is it's just a place that we're not ready to go to yet but that's not saying that we ultimately won't one day um but the united states is certainly um strange in their wording and their language and how they are attacking people these days for it and you know that's where where vexel comes in is 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 vexel is simply just a tool that connects people it's a it's a mobile app that connects you with people that you can trust based on that reputation, that real world reputation. So, you know, we're not a, we're not a Bitcoin exchange We're we're not a wallet. We are not a fiat on ramp. We never touch anything. All we do is connect you with people that you already possibly know in a privacy preserving way. So, 
looking at, you know, what it is, is right now. I'm not saying that we won't ever be there. I, I really do hope that we can be, and I hope that we can be everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, I mean, not, not amazing that, the, it, it's not in America, but uh, yeah. amazing that, that, that things like Vexel even exist. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, that's, that's what's really, you know, it, it's, I am super passionate about what, it, what we're doing. Um, you know, I've been in Bitcoin a, a very long time, um, but Vexel is the first thing that's really like, you know, lit that fire and that passion in me because um, I get to work on something that makes tries at least to make Bitcoin as it was intended to be, which is that peer to peer and without trusting any sort of third party. Um, and that's like what, yeah, that's why I get out of bed every day. Um, yeah. mm, love it. It's also interesting for me that it's a nonprofit. Um, is, is nonprofit meaning that you don't have any revenue source uh, other than outside investors, outside like uh, Satoshi Labs probably, uh, or is there some fee to it, but you don't break in a profit or like how is how is that uh, going? Vexel is 100% free, always will be. Um, we are supported purely based on donations and grants. We've received a grant from OpenSats, um, which we are very thankful for that keeps us kind of going. Um, our initial funding, yes, did come from Satoshi Labs. Um, but now we are, you know, we are actively seeking fund fundraising. Um, we were working on our geyser.fund page to seek some crowd, you know, crowdfunding as well. But Vexel truly works on value for value. Um, you know, if you have a successful trade on Vexel and you want to donate and kick back and say thanks, we love it. We're very appreciative. But we're never, ever going to put up a paywall or an obstacle to enable you to use Vexel ever. Um, there, you know, and like I said, we don't have any ability to do that because we don't facilitate any sort of Bitcoin transactions whatsoever. So there's nowhere for us to monetize. We don't we'll want that. We just want to connect you with the counterparty that you can trust and do a trade with and whatever you do with them, that's entirely up to you. Like we have zero knowledge of any of your trades or offers or conversations or we don't know anything um, because it's, it's truly private. And um, like looking at, you know, monetization. Yeah, it's not easy and it's not, you know, I don't work for free kind of thing. You know, it's like I, I have a apartment rent I have to pay for. I have a dog on my sofa over here that I have to feed, you know. Um, so donations are, are what keeps us keeps us going um, and helps us, you know, to to pay our developers a living wage and to to do these things. So. Yeah, I mean, that's what I say. If, if you use Vexel um, and you love it and it's, it's working for you and, and, you know, you want to say thank you, everything helps. Everything helps. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, it, it's important to support uh, the things that you like. And I feel like um, Bitcoin is a quite generous. Uh, I, I, at least uh, from my experience, I sometimes get like satoshis or even like uh, super fangs on youtube and stuff like that i'm like there's someone that listens to something that's completely free he has no um obligation to to give me any money i even have sponsors where they are helping me to have the show uh so i can do full-time this but because with with no sponsors i could not do it full-time because i also have to pay rent and stuff uh but even though I have sponsors, even though I make money with it, they are like, it's so valuable. I like it. And I support that on top of that. And the Vexel is really interesting because uh, I don't know how many people, how many people are, are, are working actively on, on, on Vexel. I mean, it's open source. So everybody could <laughs> work on it, but how many yeah. are actually in the team? We are five people and the dog. I joke the dog, but no, he is absolutely part of our, our, you know, daily life. Um, because when I'm in the office, he's that, he's that guy there, but no, we are five, five people. Um, and we have, you know, some amazing developers. Uh, we have Stepan who was on here. There's me and there's Leia, um, our CEO. And, um, you know, she's a, a strong, powerful woman in Bitcoin. She has a voice and, 
which is something that you you know you don't see. And you know her her history and her track record has brought her to to, to Bexel, and you know I'm I'm so happy to have her as the lead because she's a true cypherpunk um, and someone who understands the the values of of what what Bexel is and and why this is being why this is necessary. But um, we are a very small team. Um, yes, if you you know if you have some feedback, if you have, if you know, if you want to work on Vexel or if, if you see something like open an issue, um, we are open source. You can find us on GitHub. Um, so yeah, I mean, please, if you have something or, you know, especially languages as well, if you want to localize Vexel into your local community or your language, um, we have crowd in, you know, you can, you can reach out to us, get on crowd in and start translating the app. So even obscure, languages can can be to Vexel. So make Vexel is a tool for you. It's not a tool for, for you know, for anyone other than you. Um, it's a tool for me. I that you know, that's what ultimately where it came from is we wanted something that we would want to use. And so we sit down and you look at it as okay, well, what kind of solutions are there? What peer to peer solutions currently exist? And what are the problems with them? Um, and you know, if you look at um, you know, online peer to peer platforms, you know, they're, they're great. They're okay. But they do pose some risk to the individual, which is well trust. Um, you know, they're, they're KYC light. Um, because, you know, if I do a trade with somebody and my, I have to send you money via a bank, my name appears in your bank account. Or if I need to sell Bitcoin and then I have, you know, multiple transactions coming into my bank account from different people, um, my banks might start to ask questions about those transactions and I have to explain things. And, um, you know, that's I'm not saying you shouldn't explain things. I'm saying that you can start to pose a risk to the individual by using these platforms because you might trade with somebody who has a great five star reputation today. Uh, but they might commit a crime tomorrow. And then the next thing you know, you're associated with that individual. So there's a risk. And that's why you shouldn't really trade with people you don't know, or at least have some sort of level of trust with, um, you know, face to face trades are still the best way to do peer to peer because, um, it's cash. Cash is still king of privacy. Um, there's no digital trace and, it's also just kind of fun. Um, I, you know, every peer to peer trade that I've ever been on, I've, I've enjoyed it. I've never had a bad experience. Um, it's the first one you do is like this, you know, you sometimes you have to overcome that feeling. Um, but you do it and you go, that was cool. I met somebody who's like minded. And that's what you really find with with Vexel is you're meeting people who are in your social graph that have similar interests to you that want to trade and want to do it quickly and privately. Um, and looking at like, you know, other platforms is I just still think there's too much risk. Um, they use services like escrow. Escrows are a trusted third party. That's not what Bitcoin is supposed to be. Um, but I mean, I'm not, not going to understand why these platforms exist and they, they work and they're, they're beneficial for a lot of people. Um, but when it comes to, you know, scalability, in the long term, we have to look at solutions that scale, and that's where Vexel came in. Is it's open source, it's free, it's scalable, um, it's private, and you know, every single day, my network gets bigger, and it becomes easier and easier to find Bitcoin or anything like eggs from farmers, honey from farmers. These people are selling eggs and honey. On, on Vexel for Bitcoin. And the guy that I buy my eggs from now, um, like he comes to my neighborhood like every single weekend and for farmer's market. And so I just buy eggs from him with Bitcoin. Um, and then we met on Vexel. And so we, were, we had like four common connections, four people that I knew. And I didn't know the farmer. Next thing you know, I have an egg guy. And we have a, I have a friend. I enjoy seeing him every week. And we get to chat about Bitcoin a little bit, chat about what's new, get eggs. And it's a positive interaction. Um, and it's personal. When you're we're on the Internet, you lose that that sense of community. And like, you know, community is absolutely everything. It's what functions. If you visit me in Prague, you're going to ask me, what do you recommend? 
right? Where should I, where should I eat? What should I do? Because I'm someone that you trust and you value my opinions and I, I'm not going to send you to a shitty restaurant. I'm not going to go. I'm, I want you to have a good experience. And that's where we look at where, again, where Vexel is like, yeah, when you base something on reputation, um, you protect it. Because my real world reputation is what really matters to me. Um, and I have a, you know, if, like I said, if you come to Prague, I'm going to give you good things, not, not bad ones. So reputation, reputation is important. Is and that's what makes Vexel work. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self-custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in the whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description amazing and this is a, this is something uh, an extremely important point uh, which leads me to a question that i probably should have asked <laughs> earlier in the podcast um what exactly is vaxel and how does it work uh, for for the people that don't know about it for people that only uh, inducted till now with like usual kyc exchanges uh, and stuff like that and yeah you can even buy uh, like you can not only buy bitcoin but you can also like buy eggs on there like how, what is uh, vexel and how does it work so the simple answer is vexel is a mobile app that enables you to connect with people in your social graph your web of trust and that web of trust is something that you have spent your whole life getting and gaining right the people that you trust so my family my friends my colleagues what vexel does is it enables you to uh, connect with these people and do trades with them there is a marketplace that marketplace is fully anonymous because your offers are encrypted for each person individually so when I go to the marketplace, I open up Vexel and I see here is the offers for people who are selling Bitcoin. Here's the people who are bought, who are looking to buy Bitcoin. These are the people who are selling eggs and honey and products like computers. And there was someone selling a horse on Vexel, which is like was so cool. Um, and what you do is you see, oh, this offer, you share 14 mutual friends or mutual connections. This offer, you have five mutual connections, but this offer, you have 55 mutual connections. That doesn't mean that there are 55 people that you know that are on Vexel. That means that you and this person share 55 of the same connections. So, right, my friend Bob, Bob does not use Vexel, but I grew up with Bob. Bob is in my web of trust. I know Bob for years. I trust Bob. Bob trusts me. But it seems that I can see that whoever posted this offer also knows Bob. So you, I don't know who you are. You don't know who I am. But you and I both know that we know Bob. Right? 
So what I can do is even if Bob is our only common connection, if we have one, what I can do is I can say to you, my counterparty in Vexel, hey, we both know Bob. So I'm fine. I know Bob really well. I'm fine with meeting you face to face if Bob says that it's okay. So what I'm going to do, if you're okay with it, is I will send Bob a message and you send Bob a message. If Bob says, yes, Robin is a good guy or whoever you are is a good guy, then I trust Bob. So that's the difference in our reputation model. That's the difference in everything is I don't need escrow because I've got Bob. And if you screw me over, because I grew up with Bob and you know Bob for also 10 years, if you screw me over, Bob is going to be very mad at you and it's going to damage your real world reputation. And again, that's the thing that we protect more than anything. My online reputation, if I destroy it today, fine, I'll create a new one tomorrow, right? But I cannot reinvent my real world reputation without me getting up and moving to the other side of the world and changing my name. Right. And I think that that's that's really what Vexel is in practice is it's a mobile app that allows you to see offers from people that you already have connections with. So it stops at friends of friends. So if you and I know each other, I can trade with you, but I can then also trade with all of your friends. That's where it stops. It doesn't go any further than that. So you only see your network. My network is different from yours. Your network is different from Bob's. Uh, but it's possible that I'm in your network and you're in, in Bob's. But it's not the whole one, right? So if you and I trade contacts, it's going to open up your network to mine. But you and I, we don't know each other so well. So you're, it's not someone that I can say, oh, yeah, I mean, I, I went on his podcast, but I, I didn't grow up with him. So I still don't know if he's the best person to trade with, right? So at your own risk. But if I have 15 friends in common, 20 friends in common, 30 friends in common, it's very, very likely that whoever this person that I'm going to meet is, is going to be a valuable person experience in a valuable contact for me and that we can trade yeah privately i love that concept because it's 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 like the real world um just making it an open source marketplace where it's easier to exchange things and easier to to see things yeah because in the real world we also have this like for, like for, be like okay is, is there someone that knows me and is there someone that i can buy my ex from is like i live in a small town in in, in austria where there are like three farmers in like 10 15 minutes range of, of car drive where i can buy eggs yogurt meat everything from them uh, like actually from directly from that farm and it's mm -hmm. I, I i love it uh, that it is there uh yeah. and this is like uh oh i was there and and i i like it way more than the supermarket one because the supermarket one they have their labels they have their things but yeah. do i really know where it's actually coming from well that too and it's it's also like you know let's look at marketplaces right so if we look at classified ads craigslist facebook right is you know when they when they start you go oh this is great right i i can buy things from people in my community if i need a new couch fine I go to facebook marketplace and i can buy a couch today right um or if i'm looking for a flat or anything like this but then you start to see as it starts to get bigger you see the problems with scalability because now <laughs> right you go to facebook and how likely are you to get scammed from facebook marketplace right is like if you want to buy tickets to a concert i, ha I have a, a friend of mine who invited me to go to a concert with him um and i i never heard of the band um king gizzard and the lizard wizard um awesome band but i said yeah man you buy the tickets i'll go with you he goes oh it's sold out And so I said, okay, well, look on, you know, try to find them. If you, if you can get tickets, I'll go. 
Well, he wrote me. He was like, dude, I got scammed on Facebook. I sent some guy money, the money for the tickets. I was like, well, that's your fault. You know, like, I'm sorry, but like, you know, like that sucks, but you got to be more careful, you know? And um, we wound up getting tickets um, and going to the concert. And my friend who, who got scammed, you know, selling these tickets, you look at that and that's because you're not interacting with anyone that you can trust on Facebook Marketplace, right? But with Vexel, that completely changes because, right, is if somebody, if I need to sell concert tickets, I can do that. But I can see, oh, I have 10 friends in common. So like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be able, this is going to be successful. Um, and so you start introducing this as, you know, like um, Leah, my, my CEO, she wanted to, uh, we had like a Rammstein concert and the hockey world championships in Prague going on. So she was like, hey, it's a really good time to maybe rent my apartment out and earn some extra money to pay for the rent for the next month. So she put her apartment up on Vexel and was like, hey, I'm renting it. The next thing you know, that was like, that, oh, that's a completely different reputation model because you're not just renting to a total stranger that can come into a Ramstein concert and destroy your apartment, maybe. You're renting to someone who goes, yeah, we have a bunch of friends in common, so they're not going to screw up my apartment. They're not going to mess anything up. So it really starts to introduce that reputation that that truly matters. And you know, no matter how many, it's like, you know, when you get into a Uber or Bolt or anything, you know, it's like you have your your five star rating there. Um, that doesn't matter. That five star rating, it it doesn't matter because that's like someone's opinion on a certain interaction. But that's not who I am. Who I am is talk to the people that trust me. Talk to the people who I know that can vouch for me. That's something that's truly different. And that's what. And I- that's- Yeah, I I had um, uh, um, the the author of the Liberty Solution uh, on the show, Derek Wills is his name. And he talked about that because he is um, uh, deeply libertarian. And he talked about a world where we don't really need like a a monopoly on violence from the state and like a third party that is on top of it. And we talked about that is uh, the, the examples like when is, when, what happens like what what do you do when there is a clear court case of a private court who says like of a third party opinion who says like yes you have to pay him a fine of thousand euros because you crashed the garden of a house or something like that like there's a clear case uh and uh the court says that but because there's no monopoly on violence um how can this be enforced and then he was like there is a public reputation system in a private market because when all of a sudden he uh, does not uh, pay his fine uh, and the other one can now take this public and says like, okay, he is like, he, I have this court ruling of this private court uh, and it didn't, he did not pay me. So then uh, maybe his employer or maybe his uh, company or whatever he has is now like, hmm, he did not pay that. And maybe I have to question my relationship with him. So it's yeah. not the completely the same with, with, with Vaxel, but uh, I was reminded of, of that conversation with him where we are like, when we all have a reputation, like all interactions that we have with each other matter. And I like real world interactions a lot because people are more friendly. And there's one simple reason of that, because the chance of getting hit is non-zero. <laughs> like if you upset someone, the chance of someone actually hitting you is non-zero. And if you are online and um, shitting on someone, the chances of get you getting hit is zero. I mean, other than my, maybe your ha- phone falls on your head, but this, <laughs> this is a different story. Uh, and this is something where like, if there's a real world connection and there's a real world, okay, I'm giving you money. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm getting asked from that. Mm. I'm not getting scared scammed. Like if, if someone takes my money and runs away, I will run after him. <laughs> yeah. And, or, or, you know, you'll get your friends who also know that guy and you'll mob together and say, Hey, we're going to help you. Right. And that's, that's it. Right. I, I, there's nothing that currently exists like that. But in the past, you know, we lived in much 
smaller communities. You know, it was like looking at where my grandparents live, you know, there's like 140 people in their, in their city. Um, you know, they're little tiny town and reputation matters there growing up. I mean, my grandparents are people who don't have, you know, internet, who don't do these things. So the, the, how they get things done is they, they live in a community. They live in a very interesting community. They live in a community full of Mennonites, which are like, uh, Amish light. So it's a religious kind of sect that lives and my grandparents live amongst them. And, um, you know, it's a very strange, diverse kind of community, but this little town is a very good example of how reputation and real world reputation works because, you know, my grandfather has a guy that can solve each and every one of your problems because my grandfather, well, he's 94 years old and has spent his whole life gaining trust and gaining and interacting with people in this community. So when your car breaks down and, or when you have a problem, you don't go to the big box, you know, Walmart super center and get your tires located. My grandson says, let me call this guy. He'll help you. Right. And you, you do these things based on that real world reputation, right? Is, but you go to Walmart, you have a bad experience. You leave a five, you know, a, a two star review on Google and you know, that, that becomes this reputation and then it's gained. Right. But, but if I trust somebody and he recommends me you, I'm going to, okay, let's go with it. Um, and if you screw me over, that guy's never going to recommend you again, never going to work for you. So when you kind of look at uh, uh, how a community and how a local kind of society should work is, yeah, I mean, again, if you come back to, if you come to Prague, I'm going to tell you, go eat at this burger restaurant around the corner because these people have taken care of me for two years. And they they make amazing burgers and they're the nicest people ever. Right. So I think when we, when we figure out how that tool really kind of can help us and it's, it's nothing but positive because, you know, that which brings benefit is welcomed in every society. Everyone wants things that, that bring benefit, but anything that doesn't is, it should be and is repulsed and pushed away. And we should do that. So, you know, you have the ability to kind of also on Vexel is like police your own network. So if you see something or if you have a bad experience, if you have something which you don't like, you can flag that offer and it will remove it from your network. It won't remove it from, from the, that person who created the offers network, but it will remove it from yours. So effectively you policed your network, you're helping because that's what it is. It's not up to me because we don't, we're not able at Vexel, we're not able to see any of the content that's on Vexel whatsoever. Um, so it's up to you. If you see something there that you don't like, you report, you flag that offer, it's gone for you. If three other people do this, it's gone for, it's shadow banned, right? But that doesn't mean, you know, that like the offer is necessarily bad. You're just saying, oh, I don't want to see this offer in my network and I don't want my, my people to see this either. It's gone. But we, we, as a, we have no idea what's there. But uh, yeah, I I love that a lot. Honestly, it's it's um, the it, it brings in not only Bitcoin, but it brings in this idea of of the free market a lot. When we come back to the individual, and there is this great saying: the only true minority is the individual, and everything that empowers the individual and have those uh, connections uh, is is really valuable, which I'm also like, I'm looking so forward to Prague uh, because uh, I made so many great connections to people that were on the podcast, that people were with, uh, are just interacted almost daily in my comment sections because they uh, listen to the podcast really regular. I just... I'm really looking forward to meeting them all in real world and shaking their hands and, and talking with them because it's a different uh, feeling, a different situation when you have someone in, in online versus you actually know him in real life and you shook his hand, you talk about it, you, you broke the bread together, like you ate something. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, pumped about Bitcoin Prague. That's why I also make a lot of advertisement on the uh uh, channel about that but um, i'm looking forward to, to that and uh, yeah hope, hope also to, to see you there yeah 
I mean, last year, BTC Prague was, I would say, the most unexpected, right? It was the first year, um, you know, no one knew kind of what to expect going into it, but it turned out to be just the event of the year. Um, the vibe, the atmosphere, the people, the, you know, they, the, the Kukash brothers, they really are passionate about throwing an event that truly celebrates Bitcoin. And you can see that in the level of care of knowing how loud to play music so that people don't lose their voices trying to talk to each other and trying to network to the temperature and all of the atmosphere is created to really enable people to have this overwhelming positive experience. And um, that's what BTC Prague was last year. You know, it was like they were talking about the expo area. You know, you go into any other conference in the expo area is like, ah, yeah, you do one or two walkthroughs and then you're done. But last year, the expo area is where the action was. It was where everyone was hanging out, talking, communicating. And it was just something, something special. I have been to a lot of conferences. Um, BTC Prague is where it's at. Um, but Madeira, Bitcoin Atlantis was really great because you're in the sunshine. Um, that was really nice. And the, the, the temperature was perfect. And it was a lot more intimate. But BTC Prague, I, I, I cannot wait. It's next month. Um, it's coming. Um, we also, uh, we have the cypherpunk meetup on the 13th, which, um, is certainly not to be missed. If you're, if you're here for it, please come to the cypherpunk meetup. Um, it will be lots of fun. It's on a boat as well. Yeah. So yeah. Come. Love it. Uh, love it. And the, the, the last shout out that I will do is, uh, use my code Robin to get 10% off <laughs> and then we can stop yeah. <laughs> anything about Prague. Uh, but honestly, it's, it's, uh, like I can only, uh, encourage everybody to go there. It's, it's an amazing experience. Uh, it kickstarted my podcast, honestly, mm -hmm. uh, because it, uh, inspired me so much, uh, the event there that it set free some energies in mine. And I was like, um, just going like, okay, let's, let's do something in the Bitcoin community. I had no idea what I want to do, but I just started out with talking with people, interacting with Twitter, with YouTube and all this stuff, all this stuff. And all of a sudden I'm Bitcoin only. I'm working for Bitcoin basically, which is an amazing experience. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm also, deeply thankful also, for that. That's also what's so cool, right? Is that when you start working in Bitcoin, um, you really start to meet all the people. You kind of meet the people who are creating and who are building. And then like, you know, I, with me, I, I go to a lot of conferences and I do things and it's like, um, I think it was like Nifty who said, he's like, I love going to conferences because I, it's where I get to hang out with my friends. You know, we only see each other at these events, but like we all look forward to it. We know it's going to be exhausting and we know we're going to be working, but I get to, as you said, break bread and eat and dine and do these things with these people who, for me, like I've looked up to for so long. Um, like that is why I think community is so important is, you know, go find, if you do not have a Bitcoin meetup in your town, um, create one. If you have one, go visit meet other Bitcoiners because we all are number one. I think we're all super positive and optimistic people um, in a world where everything is designed to bring you down and make you scared and, and fear. Yes, there are lots of toxicity on Twitter. As you said, you, differences between the real world and the online world. And that's again, where Vexel shines is because it is the real it's real. And um go to these communities meet meet people in person and talk with them um if you have questions you know like there's so many topics that that need to be discussed in in communities and, and people that you know because like you know thinking about stuff like bitcoin inheritance right is this is a topic that you could get on the internet and you can do research but you're not going to have the right solutions you know but talking to other people and getting some ideas can help you fall down different paths to you know, making it simple for your heirs to to come in and, and be able to, to take, you know, control of your Bitcoin if something were to happen to you. Um, but it can also help you understand, you know, the best way to self-custody, the best way to, you know, start using Lightning Network or, you know, any questions that you might have. Like, if you don't have a meetup, create one. 
you know, I, I'm American, so I grew up with the movie Field of Dreams, where they said, if you build it, they will come, which is a baseball movie. But um, yeah, if you have a community, or if you don't have one, start building it, because that's, you know, we, we hear about citadels and all these things is, yes, build your, build your citadel, build your lodge, and, um, you know, start talking. And the next thing you know is you, you find that path to working on Bitcoin and working for something that truly ignites that passion in you. And you can see that. I mean, you, you said you podcast every day. You get to talk about Bitcoin every day. And that passion that you have there is what kind of it doesn't feel like work. It really like, yeah, there are days that I have a lot to do and then I'm overwhelmed. But at the end of the day, it doesn't feel like work because I get to do something that I, I love, I love doing. And where, when you say that as like, I'm so happy to hear that you had a good experience last year and that you're working in Bitcoin and that's because of BTC Prague. These are the kind of stories that, that I love is, you know, as I, that's why I talk about community is if you want to work in Bitcoin, go to a meetup, talk to people, figure out what you can do. I was an English teacher. I was a Bitcoiner that was an English teacher. I thought that I had to be some sort of tech, technical minded person to be able to write code or do something. No, um, my good friend now, John, John Galt from, from the, you know, from the Ayn Rand novel, but also his, his pseudonym is John Galt. Um, he, I met him in Honey Badger in Riga, at Bitcoin Honey Badger. And one of the first things I said, oh, what do you do? He goes, oh, I talk to people, not machines. And I was like, dude, I'm going to use that forever because that's that's exactly what you do. You know, you talk to people and that's such an important part of it is figuring out is that, you know, you can just learn how to talk to people and help educate and help, you know, spread what is essentially providing some level of freedom to to the individual. And you, you touched on something earlier that is so important is that the individual is what is important to me. It's not your country. It's not your nationality. It's none of that. It's who you are as an individual. How do you contribute to your social circle and your society and your community? That's what matters. And everything is based on those recommendations and having someone that you can trust. So looking at where, where Bitcoin is now and touching back on the very first question that you answered is that like, or did you ask which about these companies is, yeah, the very first line of the Bitcoin white paper is peer to peer electronic cash without a financial institution. Right now, when I look at the state of Bitcoin, all I see, it seems, are financial institutions that are coming in and they're trying to mirror the current financial system that we have in the world. And um, that's not Bitcoin was anti that. That's not what it is. We need to really get back to understanding that if, if we allow these people to come in and, you know, KYC everyone and just create a, a new banking system on top of what Bitcoin is, that then we're, lo we're losing it. And at Vexel, we're fighting that. In BTC Prague, in these communities and these meetups, we're fighting that. Because that's what truly matters is how we use Bitcoin. Um, we have to stop thinking of Bitcoin as an investment. Start using it. And that's where looking at where you said it's like Bitcoiners are generous, they, that you get tips and that you receive these things. And it's like, it's such a good feeling. But also that's like looking at Noster and going into Noster. It's like, man, I love sending zaps. I, lo I love it. And that's like, sp I'm spending Bitcoin. Right. Is every time. But it's value for value again, is if you post something that I like, I'm going to I'm going to zap you no matter what, um, because it's it's fun to spend that to, to show someone that you that you appreciate what they did. So um, proof of work is very important and we're doing it. And, um, you know, when you look at somebody who is creating content such as you is, yeah, you absolutely deserve because you are proof of work you deserve to have that say someone say thank you for creating this and um that's that's where we're we kind of are we're finally getting into a way that we can do that and we can make these changes uh, because now it's becoming more convenient to to use these peer-to-peer -peer platforms 
in these like things like Nostar and to participate in these systems than it is to use the ones that they want us to. I love it so much. Uh, it's it's almost like when I see all the podcasts that I'm doing is like usually the last like the the second half is better than the first half i feel like mm -hmm. i have to do like longer podcasts like three hour podcasts like <laughs> the first half hour is to warm up and then the, then it gets really good uh i just like <laughs> love to listen to, to what you just said um but uh to 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 conclude the podcast uh before we get into our intro i have one more question for you um what are you currently extremely passionate about which we did not touch on in the podcast is there anything that you're currently learning that you are currently doing activity uh, passion whatever it is that we uh, forget forgot in the podcast that we did not touch on the podcast yeah i mean one thing that's been very clear to me is you know i have been an educator for a very long time And um, I'm ex Trezor. I worked at Trezor. Um, I worked on their knowledge base, trying to craft something that could be content that is approachable and convenient for people to learn. And um, what I'm what I'm really kind of focused on now is actually um, creating something that you know meetups and these communities can take to to add value to the meetups. Because a lot of these meetups are, um, you know organized but when you get there is it can be people having beers and you know discussing but there might be new people so we're we're right now we're trying to kind of i'm really kind of create a tool that can really help communities and meetups come together and have topics to talk about to have like the ability to welcome new people into their like meetup and like ask the right questions and figure out these paths so um, you know, plan B has done a really good job with these like exams and this Bitcoin education. And there's a lot of these initiatives going around and Bitcoin education is something that I'm very, very passionate about currently, uh, because we need to be able to answer those questions, which is, all right, I've studied Bitcoin. I've stopped thinking about Bitcoin as a way to achieve a Lamborghini. I've started looking at Bitcoin this way, but how do I buy it? How do I keep it safe? How do I plan for my inheritance? These kinds of things. Um, because it's one thing to own Bitcoin, um, but it's another to learn how to interact with it. And so, so my passion is, is still in education um, and finding ways to help people kind of get there and, and understanding, and but also have the tools to talk to their aunts and uncles and moms and grandparents and people who don't don't know so um yeah that's where i am right now and hopefully we'll have something soon with, with vexel we are we are working on some tools to help, kind of help empower meetups and add that value to them is um yeah i hope to have something for everybody soon if you have a meetup like i said please get in touch um we want to help you grow That's all we want to do. Grow local peer-to-peer -peer communities. Perfect. Um, I will I will just leave it like that because it's 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 uh, wonderful how you said it. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is, uh, which is a really interesting concept because it's like connecting those those guests like uh, like in the blockchain, uh, pointing yeah. to the next guest. Um, the question is, And it's a really interesting one. What will be the biggest Bitcoin economy outside of the USA in five years? The biggest Bitcoin economy outside the USA in five years. First of all, do you agree that uh, USA is the biggest Bitcoin economy? Only because of sheer number of people. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, but does Europe count? I mean, how do we look at, like, if we look at the European Union... Um, what I see is something very different happening here in the EU versus the United States. Here, community is absolutely at the center of the movement of what's happening here. In America, you know, it's Coinbase floating a QR code around during the Super Bowl. Um, and you have this still this like ETS investment kind of thing. But 
I do think that the biggest Bitcoin economy and, and, and what I what I kind of really feel that that is, is the ability to spend my Bitcoin, the ability to earn Bitcoin, the ability to do these things. Um, I do think that there is there are things happening in Europe that are very, very cool. You know, you look at BTC Prague, um, you know, come to Czech Republic. You can spend Bitcoin near <laughs> everywhere. Like every pub I go to, there's a QR code on the table. When I'm done, I can pay with lightning and go out in, in, in my, you know, in my meal. So I, I do think that Europe is, is stands a good chance. I also look at, you know, I look at countries in South America. You know, these are not big, big economies by, you know, you know, currently. But I look at them and I, I see Bitcoin growth everywhere. I really do. But I think Europe will probably be the biggest one. Yeah. I love it. So the, the biggest economy outside of the USA will be the USA because <laughs> Europe will be the, the bigger one. Um, perfect. And thank you, Crafton, for, for being on the podcast. Thank you uh, for, for taking the time to, to be on the show. Um, before I let you go, where can people find you? Where can people get in touch with you? Where can people uh, ask you questions in the best way? Yeah, please, please reach out. Um, I want to hear your criticisms. I want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear that all, right? Is we are building a tool for you, for the individual, for the people. So if you, if something isn't clear, if something is, if I didn't touch on something here, uh, please check out our website, vexel.it. You know, we always joke is like, how do you get Bitcoin? It's not Vexel Italy. It's how do you get Bitcoin? You Vexel it. And by Vexeling it, that means no KYC peer to peer. So you vexel it. Uh, I am Sats Disco, like Satoshi's Sats Disco, like a disco dancer um, on Noster, on X, Twitter, whatever they call it these days. Um, but yeah, I mean, please reach out. There are, there are a few things that I we didn't touch on on the podcast. Um, which is like the, the essential things of how Vexel works. But I think you had Stefan on and, and Stefan, it would, you know, you can look at his podcast with you as well. Um, but yeah, find me there. You can also find my dog on uh, Twitter as well. He's Ash the Vexel dog. He is a great follow um, on the internet. No one knows you're a dog, uh, but in real life, he's the friendliest boy and has the best reputation ever. Um, so yeah, that's how you find me and get in touch. Please reach out. Please reach out. I want to hear from you. I will have to check out uh, the the dog uh, profile definitely, and maybe we can, uh, as you mentioned her in the in the podcast, maybe we can get Leah on in in some time so we can conclude the whole uh, Vexel team at some point. Uh, I love to to do the to do Vexel. To do, to do the Vexel round and we can have like a small playlist on the YouTube Vexel playlist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, thank it. you so much. I will definitely let her know. Um, yeah, I, it's been a pleasure. It's been a joy talking to you. I will see you in a month. You're coming here. So let's let's meet. Let's let's have a beer. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for being on.